Hello, Team Lift Tribe. So thankful that you're here with me again. This day is an especially exciting day for me. Um, most of you probably don't know. I don't talk about it too much, especially on here. Uh, but I've been suffering some vision issues for the last 18 months. And hopefully tomorrow I'll have all of it resolved um, as best as I can. I've had some retina issues, a retina infection that almost blinded me about a year ago. As a result of uh, those retinal issues, I've formed a cataract that has really obscured my vision. And tomorrow, Lord willing, I'll be going to cataract surgery and getting it removed and getting it replaced with a artificial lens. And this is especially exciting for me because this has been a struggle for me like I've never experienced. It's actually the reason why this podcast came to be. I was having so many wonderful conversations with brethren uh, that I was looking to find encouragement from uh, over the phone, on the internet, and we were having such great, rich conversations. I was just thinking, man, I need to record these things. I need to have other people hear these things because it's benefited me so much. And this past year, aside from COVID, has been such a whirlwind for me, up and down roller coaster of emotions, of you know, physical issues that I've been having, uh, the reaction from the drugs that they were prescribing me and and just so many things have been going. Uh, lots of things went wrong, unexpected. And I've been having to battle with lots of things and found lots of encouragement from this and, and from my brethren. And hopefully if you're going through something, if you have uh, something that you've never had to go through before, it's been the roughest time, rough patch for your life. Hopefully this is something that will help lift you up. Now, my next guest is someone you may know. Uh, someone that I had known about in the Brotherhood for quite some time, and this is Kyle Butt. He is uh, a brother who works with the apologeticspress.org. Uh, and if you have, if you've been a Christian for long and looked up anything on apologetics, uh, this is some. This is one of the Brotherhood's go-to sources for Christian apologetics, and he's been working with them for a long time now. I think twenty years or so. And it was such an amazing time talking with Kyle, discussing these spiritual things. So I hope you get something out of it. Hope you can uh, find some encouragement from these things. And if you are, consider subscribing, consider liking, sharing it with somebody else that may need to be lift up. So without further ado, our brother in Christ, Kyle Butt. Pray and read your Bible, whether or not you feel anything good about it. And what I mean by that is, I think sometimes we have the, the misunderstanding that if I'm reading my Bible and I'm not getting a whole lot out of it, or if I'm praying and I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over, and I don't feel like God is there in the prayer, then I'm just going to quit it yeah. because it's doing us no good. It's doing me no good. I don't think God likes it. But that mindset, I think, is, is pretty dangerous in that. I don't think that's how God wants us to approach any type of thing that will help us. And what I mean is from the physical standpoint, I don't like exercise. I never have liked it. Some people love to run. Those people are crazy. And I don't know why <laughs> that they love it, but more power to them. I'm excited about it. I have to make myself run. I've never enjoyed it. In fact, I talked to one guy one time and I asked him if he ran. He said, no. And here's why. When I see people on the side of the road running, they always look miserable. And until I see somebody who looks like they like it, I'm not going to start. <laughs> well, you know, the problem with that is, yes, of course, they look miserable by the running and it's not any fun. And But after you get done running, you feel like you did something that you should have done and it's better for you. Yeah. And so what I early on there, I guess, I don't know, I might have been 17, 18. I realized that I was spending more time doing stuff that was secular academically than I was spiritually. And so I, I realized I was reading history books for 30, 40 minutes, and then I'd go to math and then I'd go to whatever, but I, I wouldn't be reading my Bible. And so I kind of determined I'm going to read my Bible 
before I do any of my other school work, for the time that I would do my longest school work study. So if I was going to read history for 40 minutes, then I'd read my Bible 40 minutes and then do the history and the math, etc. Well, I didn't like it. it. It felt constrained and it felt like exercise and it felt like uh, it didn't give me a warm, fuzzy feeling. And I rolled through the genealogies and Leviticus and all that stuff and just thought, why is this in here? What am I doing here? But I just made myself do it. It was just something I said, I'm doing. And now it's something that I thoroughly enjoy and love. And lots of times if I have a choice between the Bible or some other exciting adventure book, I'm going for the Bible. But mm -hmm. at first it was just something I just didn't like. And that's just a fact. I don't think you can get around that. And so if I were to tell Christians, hey, how can you really get through this stuff? I would say, forget how you feel about praying, reading the Bible, doing stuff for your family, doing stuff for others that you just don't feel the feeling there of whatever. Who cares about the feeling? Do it because it's your job. And later, I think you'll really be glad you did it and it will open up insight for you just because you made yourself do it. And so, you know, the old Nike, just do it. Just, just get them and do it. And eventually you'll feel what will follow from that. But if you wait for that feeling, it's not going to happen. We all know that this world is full of problems. With fearful news and negativity at every turn, it's even hard for Christians not to get discouraged. So I invite you to join us as we focus on the good that's happening all around and discuss how we can be blessed and bless others, especially in troubling times. Encouraging each other is a huge task. It's a team sport which requires a team lift so we can build each other up and restore unity and hope to the church. Even Jesus needed help carrying his cross. You're not alone, and we're here to show you just that. All glory to God. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace and of mercy, so thankful for this day of life. We thank you for the opportunity and the technology to meet in this way and discuss ever-important, encouraging, and spiritual matters. We thank you, Lord, for the leaders of the church, the ones who have taken on the role of shepherding your flocks. We pray, Lord, that you would be with all of the members and the souls of your son's body. We pray that you would help us to do our part to encourage, uplift, and to teach. We pray as we discuss spiritual matters today that you be with Kyle and myself as we do our best to edify and uplift the church. We pray for all of those who are struggling at this time. We pray that you would help them in you knowing their needs, that you would help them to get through the things that they are battling with. And we pray, Lord, that we all can reach that goal in the end. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, for without him, none of this would be possible. We pray all this by the authority of his name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm joined here by my brother in Christ, Kyle Butt. He has been so gracious to take some time today and, and join me. And Kyle, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm glad to do it. I'm excited about it. I appreciate what you're doing here and glad to be a part of it. Yeah, so real quick, Kyle, uh, where, where are you at and what's the congregation that you are worshiping with? I am in Columbia, Tennessee, and my family and I worship with the Southgate Church of Christ and have been here now for about three years, moved up here from Florence, Alabama, and this is where I grew up, and this is where my parents are and brother, and so we're here in Columbia. Great. It's, it's really a blessing to be nearby family. It is. Yes. And, and so in, in just a few minutes, Kyle, what led you to obey the gospel? When I was thinking about that question that you had posed, I was thinking to Paul talking to Timothy and how he had said that your grandmother's faith and your mother's faith, which was also in you. And really, I was a product of that kind of home. 
my father had grown up in the church. My mother did not grow up in the church, but she was converted by my dad and was very, very on fire for the gospel and for Christ and just felt like once she became a Christian, that that was her life's mission to spread that message as far and wide as possible. And they were in Portland, Tennessee, and they were doing very well. My dad had purchased a car dealership and it was financially very successful, but they felt the need to sell it and go to the Bear Valley School of Preaching. And so my mom tells me, of course, I don't remember this, but she tells me I slept on a pallet at about a year and a half, two years old through the Bear Valley School of Preaching classes. And so, you know, I feel like I've been through the School of Preaching there and yeah. got out of there. They did stateside mission work in East Tennessee in Bluntville. And I remember being a part of the door knocking and the tent meetings and all of those things. And so, you know, I was following in my parents' footsteps. Now, of course, I deal with the skeptical community a lot, and they will say, well, you just end up whatever your parents were or whatever geographical location you are, and it's the main determinant of what religion you are. But as I thought through that and looked at that, there were certainly times in my life that I had to think through and question, hey, is this the truth? Is this right? Does this have the evidence to back it? And sadly, you know, there are a lot of people who grew up doing the things we were doing that have subsequently left the church. And so you wanted them to hold on to that faith that was there and they didn't. And that is sad. And as you look at that, you just realize though that the best way you feel like God talking to the Israelites there in Deuteronomy chapter six, hear O Israel, the Lord your God is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And these things you shall teach to your children. And that is one of the most productive, effective ways to spread the faith and to teach the faith and to pass it on down. And God picked Abraham because he said he will teach his children after him the things that I'm saying. And I was a product of faithful parents who did that. Amen. So how old were you when you decided that you had to be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins? You know, that's a great question. And I have a very odd memory in so far as I can remember lots of details, facts, etc., about things that I read, things that I try to memorize, scriptures, things like that. But when it comes to things that I did in my life, I my my memory all kind of mushes together. And I know I did the things, but if you were to say when, lots of times I say, I don't know when that happened. Yeah. So I just remember going into my parents and saying, I need to become a Christian and them saying, Hey, that's exciting. You know, something like that. Let's think about it further. And so we did a little bit. And I just remember one night that the feeling that I needed to have my sins forgiven and to be a part of the body of Christ in so far as to have that blood of Christ cover my sins was overwhelming. And I went into my parents and I just said, I need to become a Christian tonight. And so that's when I was baptized into Christ and was just so thrilled to get to be a part of the saved body of Christ that is on its way to heaven. And when that happened, you know, I could probably do a little research and go back to my mom <laughs> and say, mom, you know, when was this? But I, I don't know exactly. Well, that's, that's interesting that you say that as far as um, two, two reasons that came to my mind. One is that, that your examples and your of your parents and those around you it was kind of just a natural progression of things and it just kind of blended right in it was not you know just didn't really miss a beat in, in that way and 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 the other is that how you said you went to your parents they said oh that's that's interesting let's let's think about it a little bit and and that was kind of um one of those things where a lot of parents would be like let's go let's go right now let's go do it and and maybe prematurely and when right. you realize I need to do it now, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's when, you know, it's a real good indication that you really are understanding the, the gravity of the situation. Right. And, you know, I had a friend from college, John Farber, years later, he was a youth minister and he said that he would have eight, nine year olds come to him and say, I want to become Christian. And the parents just didn't really know what to do with that yeah. type of situation insofar as they didn't know if their kid was ready or not. And he said, is there any written material out there in the brotherhood on that? And we looked and didn't find any. And so he and I wrote a book titled, Am I Ready to Be Baptized? That is, you know, hardback. We made it intentionally hardback so that a person could keep it 
as they go through and read and then there are questions at the end and to almost just kind of gauge the level of seriousness that a child has. And so when my son, I think he might've been eight or nine came to me and said, Hey, I want to become a Christian. I said, and I always, I always think that's exciting. That's thrilling. It's one of the best decisions. It's the best decision you can make in your life. Let's think about that. And let's read through this book and it's a real short book. And so I said, you know, basically read a chapter and we'll talk about it and then read another chapter. We'll talk about it, read another chapter. Well, he got through one chapter and he was about done with it. Yeah. So I thought, all right, that helps us understand the seriousness or lack thereof of his decision when he's eight, when he's nine. Right. And then later, I think he was about 11 or 12 and got much more serious about it. So it was a good tool to help us say, hey, that's great. Are you willing to put the work in to see if you're serious about it? And you know what we find out and equally as exciting both ways is some of the kids are, yes, they read through it in a night or two and they become Christians. And at the end, we say, write down why you need to do this. Yes. What, what's your understanding of Jesus? What's your understanding of sin, et cetera. And then equally, like I said, exciting is the group that says, hey, we read it or we got through half of it and we weren't really ready to become Christians. And we did that later, a couple of years or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm gonna have to get that book for my for my kids. I've had one of those run ins with my oldest. And okay. it was kind of one of those things. Let's let's think about it. You know, let's talk about it. And, right. and you know, so we kind of did a little study and but I had no idea what to do. I was like caught like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> right. Well, so. that's the that's the response that I think most of us have is, mm -hmm. oh, this is great. Now, what do I do? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, are do they know enough? Have I taught them enough? Are they serious enough? And we felt like this little book really gauges that for you. At least it helps it. And and the book is called. Um, what's it? It's called "Am I Ready to Be Baptized?" Okay, all right. I'll certainly check that one out. So, uh, what's something this past year that that you've learned that's really helped you grow? I was thinking about that question too, and the answer that came to me on that was that there are things you thought were the right way or the way you'd always done them. And in your mind, you really felt like that's correct. That needs to be done that way. But then when COVID hit and things started getting adjusted and things like that, you then had to ask yourself, hey, you know, I've always said that this is what has to be done, but is this really what has to be done? And so the thing that I guess I've learned this past year is the Bible is the authority on everything that we do. And tradition from where we grew up, what we've done all our life, we don't realize, I think, sometimes what a hold that has on our thinking. And so when things started changing, we had to ask ourselves the question, does the Bible really say this is the way it has to be done? Am I projecting this onto the moral discussion because the Bible says it or because that's how I've always done it. And, you know, I felt like I came out of there thinking when I'm reading the New Testament about the Pharisees and they had always washed their hands before meals and they probably had very good moral reasons for that because it helps you stay ceremonially pure. And this is just seems like the best way to do it. And I don't know why anybody would not want to do it this way, et cetera. Okay. But but what was that something God had really said? Right. And so I guess it helped me think, let's take a step back and ask ourselves the question, is this something that God has asked us to do? Or is this something that we've done for years that could be adjusted and not violate any biblical principle whatsoever? And so that's probably what I've learned in the last year. Certainly. And along with that, you don't know what you're going to be doing the next week. And so just remember James chapter four, what is your life? It's even a vapor. It appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Come now you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a city. We'll spend a year there, buy, sell, make a profit. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow for what's your life. Right. And any number of times back in December, I got COVID and had, I was supposed to do a seminar. Seminars were just now opening back up. It was going to be one of the first that I had, schedule that I was actually going to go do. And Thursday before that, boom, got COVID. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Well, then my kids have to quarantine at home, but one of them doesn't. And so we're running all over the place. And you just think, these are the things I thought was going to happen this year, where these are the things were going to happen. And this is how I thought my life was going to go, but not really how my life went. And hey, you get 24 hours every day, and that's enough to accomplish exactly what God wants you to accomplish in those 24 hours. But what God wants you to accomplish might not be what you thought you were going to get done those, that day. Certainly. <laughs> you know, it, there, I think a lot of people uh, were, have been having such a hard time adjusting to these things because of, not because of what was actually going on, but, but of those expectations. You know, the, the, the things that we, we thought was going to happen, and then we forget about James. We forget that, hey, you know, we need to be able to just, you know, you know kind of just live in the moment that we, we don't have tomorrow promise for us, and, and that we need to, you know, look at what's in front of us. And, and so many people, including myself, had a hard time adjusting when things are going upside down. Well, what, what are we supposed to do now? I had all these things planned out, and now what am I supposed to do? So, I think, that, yeah, and... Like, like I say, yeah, I just, you know, you look at how Job's life came to an abrupt halt. Yeah. And if you were just to ask what he was doing before all that stuff happened, well, you talk about full days of taking yeah. care of one of the biggest ranches, basically, in the entire eastern part of the whole world comes to a halt. Mm-hmm. When Jesus interacts with Peter, James, and John, and their whole schedules change when he says, come and follow me. And it's just, okay. We will. And I think there's just a lot of room in the Christian life to say, I'm going to plan. But when those plans get adjusted, I'm going to say, no, God's in control. And I will roll with this because this is what's happening. Certainly. And I I just uh, spoke with um, uh, a brother from North Mississippi, uh, one of the elders at the South Haven congregation. He said uh, the the unwritten beatitude, uh, Blessed are those who are flexible, for they will not be bent out of shape. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> so, as as you know, as we all know, looking at the news, you know, we kind of just want to turn it off and and wish it would just go away. Sometimes there's just so much bad news, so much negativity, so much division, so many problems in the world. And so, one of the things that I'm trying to do with this podcast is combat that with good news, with positive things. So. What is something positive that you can share with us that's happened to you in the past you know, several months or so? I always think if your eyes are open, you can see unbelievable things that the Lord is doing. It amazes me to see how the Lord works through situations like this last year. And I can just give you a few from my experiences this last year. Because, of course, that's the ones I'm aware of. But I think Mm -hmm. this would be multiplied by the tens of thousands or millions across the country. But we recently put out a study Bible, the Apologetics Press Defending the Faith Study Bible, which is the first one of its kind ever done in the Brotherhood. For years, people had asked us, hey, do you have a study Bible that you would recommend? But because of some of the false teaching and things that are in virtually every study Bible we've ever seen, that we just couldn't recommend that. And so we decided we were going to do one. And we had about 40 years worth of materials on our website and started seeing how that would fit in a study Bible format. And so it took us about eight years to get done. And uh, a year and a half, two years ago, we were able to put that out. The first printing before it hit our office floor was totally gone. The second printing, very much like it. We just got through with the third printing in a course of a year and a half to the tune of about 22,000 copies of it. But in that time, because to me, the prospect of it is so exciting. It's got all of the Christian evidence material, but also has all of the good teaching on the structure and organization of the church, the ideas of the plan of salvation, the correct teaching on any number of issues that we've just never seen in the study Bible format. Mm -hmm. And people who will take a study Bible will not take other information. If you were to give them a book, lots of times what we've seen is they would look at the book and say, who's this by whatever, but a study Bible they would take and think, Oh, okay, great. It's a study Bible. Mm -hmm. And so in the past year and a half, we've been able to one guy that I went to school with Doka Obadiah there from Nigeria. He is a preacher and works with a preaching school in Nigeria. He contacted me 
and said, hey, do you have some materials you can send our preaching students? We got about 250 of them or so. And I said, well, actually, I think he said if we needed 500. And I said, well, you know, we've got this new study Bible. He said, that would be perfect if you could get it here. And I said, you know, shipping it would be crazy. Yeah. If they weigh five pounds a piece, they're 2,500 pages full color. And I said, to ship the thing would be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Well, got in touch with another missionary that was going over there, Steve Wordley. And he was sending a tractor via a container that was going to ship in March or whatever. And so he said, yeah, you could just fill around the tractor with all the study Bible boxes. Well, still, you know, the, the printing cost was going to be crazy with that kind of book. But the printer made a mistake and messed up a little ribbon on top of the binding. Now, it didn't hurt the binding at all. It was just cosmetic. But because of that, they gave us quite a bit of a discount on the printing. And then we had one foundation that basically said, hey, what can you do with this? We've seen the study Bible. We like it. And so they gave us several thousands of dollars. And so we were able to ship 750 study Bibles to the preaching students in Nigeria and Joss that were then able to have, you know, I think something that they probably never had. You, you're talking about a, an extremely high quality study Bible with virtually everything in it you would need to answer any of the evolutionary questions, any of the denominational questions, any of those church organization, plan of salvation, women's role questions, all of that. And it's because the printer messed up on a ribbon and somebody was shipping a tractor over. Yeah. And so you see stuff like that. And I just got a, a text from a girl there in East Tennessee, Jenny Hanstein, who her husband is the director of the now Southeastern Institute of Biblical Studies, but used to be the East Tennessee School of Preaching. And she read it and said, this is amazing. We've, we've got to start getting this out. And so she raised enough money to put 200 of them into the school where her kids go. And she said, uh, I don't know if it's where her kids go, but it's a Christian school there in Knoxville. But she said 80, 90 percent of the people aren't New Testament Christians yeah. and they need this kind of material. So she got 256 of those for her homeschool co-op. And this school sent me a text that said the kids literally were hugging their Bibles. They had never had a printed Bible. And the teachers were crying when they got that. Now, that was mind boggling to me because, you know, I got probably 20 Bibles laying around in any number of translations or whatever. But then when I thought about it, you think most people are accessing stuff on their phone in a lot of ways, et cetera. And so, yeah, this might be the only printed Bible that they ever have. And it's got the stuff that they need really to help them understand. And, you know, as you think through that, I know I'm getting a little windy here, but as you think through it, Philip going to the eunuch on the road there where he was going home and to Ethiopia. And he's reading the scriptures and Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And the treasurer there says, well, how can I unless someone helps me? And beginning of that scripture, Philip preached to him Jesus. Well, I think really in, in a very real sense, that's what your study Bible is doing. Right. It's taking them from the scripture where they are and getting them to Jesus and to his church and to obedience to the proper plan of salvation and things. And so I'm really, really excited about that. And I could really multiply those kinds of stories on a smaller scale several times over. And it's really thrilling to me to see what God is doing because everybody was sitting at home needing something to read, something to go through. And so 22,000 study Bibles have left our office because People were home on their computers thinking, I need to be getting spiritually stronger here. What's a resource that I can use for that? Man, su such a wonderful, inspiring story. And, and look at the providence of God. I worked in that, that one single instance. And like you said, multiply that by, by all, these, all these things. And, and it's just um, the work that has been going on and the progress has been happening this past year sometimes it's, it gets missed sometimes we see think uh, all is lost you know with this world is going down the tube and not so not so even though these things are being broadcast in the on the news and on social media they are happening and and people's lives are being changed in a positive and, and powerful way well and i think what you're doing is an example of that when did you start the podcast here it was this past october and why'd you do that? Yeah, I, we, I needed this <laughs> myself. Right. And I thought other people needed it. <laughs> That's right. So I think as you look at that, and I mean, what we're doing here, I think is a testimony to what you just said, yeah. 
the Lord can use any number of instances and circumstances to bring about, well, you know, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And it doesn't matter if it's the middle of a pandemic. It doesn't matter if it's the middle of financial prosperity or lack thereof. All things do work together for good to the people who are loving God and trying to see his will in their life. Amen. Amen. Very inspiring story. Thank you for that. I'm all encouraged. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm feeling real good. So I know we're talking about Bibles, and I know this is uh, this takes the cake as far as impact you know, in the world and in our lives as Christians. But what, what are some other books that have most impacted your life, Kyle? Well, these, as I was thinking about that question, there are any number of good books that deal with single books of the Bible. There's one by Avon Malone called Press to the Prize on the Book of Philippians that he had a cassette series with. Now I say cassette to show you how old this series is, but I remember listening to that cassette series and reading through that book, just thinking this man has a great understanding of the book of Philippians. And of course I'd been reading Philippians for years and had never looked at the book of Philippians in a way that he was presenting it. And so any number of books like that from men in the brotherhood who have analyzed single books of the Bible. But one of the books that ironically has been so impactful to me years and years ago, this is not a book that has anything to do really with religion whatsoever or the Bible or Christianity or anything like that. But it was written by a guy named Mortimer J. Adler and it's titled How to Read a Book. And everybody thinks they kind of know how to read a book. And it's... I'm going to say it's 550 pages of tiny little type and in some ways extremely boring. But in other ways, when you get done with it, you don't look at reading the same and it helps you process the information in books so much more thoroughly and efficiently. And I'll look and be watching people in the airport or things like that. The way that they're reading and sometimes I'll think, okay, that guy has read how to read a book. And there are very few people who I think have ever read it because it in some ways is so very dry. But in other ways, if you slog through it and make yourself get it done, then at the end of it, you realize, oh, hey, that is uh, something that I will have for the rest of my life. And I'll process information through books very different. And I was talking that, you know, I've, I've dropped that to several people and I can't remember anybody actually reading it. They just say, oh yeah, interesting. And because we all think I know how to read a book, but one of my, well, the preacher at the congregation where I go here, John Thomas, I mentioned it to him and he called me back. I'm going to say two, three weeks ago, he said, well, you know, I sure appreciate you ruining the way I read books from now on. <laughs> and I said, well, you know what, he said, you know, I got that book, how to read a book and it's incredible. And I'm about, I think he might have been 60 pages into it or something. And he said, yeah, it's taken me a while, but it's really making an impact on how I view reading. And you just never thought, okay, I didn't really have a thorough understanding of reading books. So anyway, uh, you know, as I think about that, the, and the guy is a philosopher. He is a faith-based philosopher. And he's written several other books. I think he's got one called 10 Philosophical Mistakes That People Make. But that book was just kind of life-changing. And so anyway, that, that's the one I'd probably throw out there at the present if you were just sitting around the house and you had extra 30 hours or something. <laughs> that, that's what um, I, I like to call sharpening the saw right there. <laughs> right. That's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> so... Thinking back in your life, Kyle, what failure or apparent failure has set you up for success later down the road? Well, this one is, is odd insofar as it's not, you wouldn't view it as anything that is profound. But years ago when I was at Freed Hardeman, I was always a public speaker, even always from high school and was in public speaking contests and things of that nature and felt pretty good about you know my oratorical abilities and presence standing up in front of people etc and i was in 
I think it was, it might have been senior seminar class or something with Ralph Gilmore. I'm trying to, it wasn't debate per se, but that's what the class revolved around, mm -hmm. you know, logical argumentation, et cetera. And so I was supposed to debate Ralph Gilmore, where at the time I was also preaching at a congregation outside of Henderson in my junior and senior year of college there. And so one of the things that had come up at the congregation was there were several people who believed in the 8070 doctrine that Christ had come back in 8070. And I think it's called realized eschatology. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me. It was odd and wrong, but I hadn't really done a lot of study on it or whatever. And so we had to pick a debate topic and I picked that. Well, in my mind, I really thought I had it nailed down and thought that this is airtight. There's no way that Ralph Gilmore can, because you're debating Ralph Gilmore and you're dealing with these topics. And so I got up there and just presented, you know, what I felt like was the way to present this and that it didn't matter, you know, how it came across as far as what the audience thought about it. This was the logical way to put it. Well, I just remember just getting demolished by Ralph, just destroyed. And my best friend at the time, my roommate, Josh Ketchum, I said, you know, Josh, how did, how did that go? I just felt like I had it exactly right. He said, well, you were right, but you just looked wrong. And he said, you, you just got demolished. So what it taught me was that, and I've never been good at this, but it, it helped me be better was that how you come across to people makes a humongous difference in how they accept what you're saying. Hmm. And my thought there was, if I just show them one plus one equals two, it doesn't matter how I say it, doesn't matter how it's presented, right. that's right. And hey, if they're thinking correctly, they'll take it. Right. But it taught me that, hey, you, your presentation and the way it's put forward really makes a big difference. And I think that was preparing me providentially there for several of the debates that I have been in. I've been in three major debates with some of your high profile atheists. And I don't say that in any kind of way other than I think that my training and me getting thumped by Ralph Gilmore when I was a junior, senior in college at Freed helped me realize, now hold on just a second, Kyle, there's a full audience out there of people that it's going to be very important how they perceive what you say. You need to say the right thing. It needs to be true. And you need to think about how best they would accept it. Very good. Very well said. I think a lot of times um, we, we all go through that where we think, okay, well, it's just the, just the facts, the evidence, but it is also, you know, the presentation and how we, we come across to others, most certainly. So when when you think of um, how you live your life and, and when you're going through your daily routines and things, are there any quotes that you think of often or that you, you live your life by? You know, probably most of mine are Bible quotes. Okay. Insofar as I take in the Bible through listening for the most part. And years ago, I read about every book that's out there. I try to. And I'll take one with me to the ballpark and take one with me if I got five or 10 minutes in my truck, whatever. Not, I would just always read books, half since I was in high school. But I wouldn't do that with the Bible because I felt like, okay, if you're not totally zoned in and focused on the Bible, then you shouldn't be reading it, shouldn't be picking it up. You should put that aside for a time when you're devotionally or very intellectually engaged in that process. But I don't know at what point it was that I thought that doesn't make any sense. Insofar as you mean to tell me that if you got five or 10 extra minutes, you'll read this book that you just picked up yesterday, but you won't take that five or 10 extra minutes to read or listen to the Bible. Mm. And so I keep it running a lot. And now there again, I'm not saying this any kind of bragging way or any kind of, Hey, look at how righteous I am because I am so far from applying the things that I learn on a regular basis. But uh, I am saying, you know, when I get in my truck, my Bluetooth picks up my phone and it's on James 2. When I am doing some menial things around the house, I'm listening to, to the Bible. And I'll go through James, the book of James, and really have only concentrated on 
a chapter out of the five. Yeah. But in my mind, I have thought, well, one chapter of James out of five is better than any number of songs that I might hear or regular secular books that I'll be listening to. So if I only get one chapter, if I roll down the road and I've got my Bible playing and I've been driving for an hour and I've really only concentrated on that Bible for 10 minutes, well, that's 10 minutes more than I had before I turned the Bible on. And so I just thought any bit of Bible that gets in my mind is better. But because of that, you know, because of the, the audio that I run lots of times, I, most of them are are biblical quotes. And of course, the one I guess that I think about all the time, and I don't know why this one is so profound to me, but it's the proverb that says, now, another problem with this is I never know where these come from as far as like Proverbs chapter, or whatever. It's just, it's, it's words running through and right. the audio doesn't say this is Proverbs 14, three or this. And right. so I, I, I'm bad with where this stuff comes from. Oh, we can find it though. <laughs> it, but yeah, I mean, but I, if I don't know where it is, let's go to Google and type in the three That's words right. <laughs> that I need and it pops up. That's right. But the one that, that I think is the wise man foresees evil and hides himself and the fool passes on and is punished. Hmm. And it's the idea that there are a lot of people tripping through this life. And I remember, I think I watched the movie, I mean, the uh, show, the Broadway show Wicked. And one of the songs in it is about the, basically the playboy that has the philosophy of, I'm just tripping through life. I'm not thinking about what's going to happen next. I'm not thinking about what happened yesterday. I'm just here for the party. And I think that's how a lot of people are. And if you don't somehow look forward and say, now, wait a second, why am I here? What is happening today? that is going to impact what's going to go on in the future. If you don't look forward and make plans, and of course, ultimately for your eternal destination, but then I think also for, okay, at the end of this life, do you want to say that I spent my life and this was the activity that primarily consumed eight hours of my day every single day? And so I just think it's a, it, I, I don't know how many times a day I think of that. But I think, okay, I'm right now doing this. In the future, would I want to have said, this is how I spent my time this day, this week, et cetera. And so that's one of them. And then there's a Zig Ziglar one. I don't know if you've ever listened to much Zig Ziglar. He's kind of old school, motivational. Mm -hmm. And he says, you're what you are and you're where you are because of what goes into your mind. You can change mm -hmm. what you are. You can change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. And then he follows that up with, if you put in the good, the clean, the pure, the powerful, and the positive, then that will build you up as a person. But if you don't, and you let other influences be the ones that are in your ear most of the time, then you can just count on, they will drag you down. And of course, really, that's just the secular motivational way to get Philippians, what, four, eight there. What's everything things are true, what's everything things are noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, everything praiseworthy. If there's anything of virtue, think on these things. So, you know, I, you're what you are, you where you are, because what goes into your mind, and you can change that by changing what goes into your mind. Probably those are the two I think about the most. Excellent. Those are very inspiring, and they kind of help you get through the day and, and make the right choices. Mm -hmm. Right, certainly. And we, we know this year, like we, we mentioned a few times, you know, because of what was going on in the political climate, what's going on in the, you know, the, the world as far as health goes and we have so many people that are that are struggling that aren't able to really adapt or, or they're letting their expectations uh, get the best of them we have a lot of christians who are struggling right now what sort of advice would you give a struggling christian uh, right now today my advice to struggling christians is pray and read your bible whether or not you feel anything good about it. And what I mean by that is, I think sometimes we have the, the misunderstanding that if I'm reading my Bible and I'm not getting a whole lot out of it, or if I'm praying and I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over, and I don't feel like God is there in the prayer, then I'm just going to quit it. Yeah. Because it's doing us no good, it's doing me no good, I don't think God likes it. 
that mindset, I think, is, is pretty dangerous in that I don't think that's how God wants us to approach any type of thing that will help us. And what I mean is, from the physical standpoint, I don't like exercise. I never have liked it. Some people love to run. Those people are crazy. And I don't know why <laughs> that they love it, but more power to them. I'm excited about it. I have to make myself run. I've never enjoyed it. In fact, I talked to one guy one time and I asked him if he ran. He said, no. And here's why. When I see people on the side of the road running, they always look miserable. And <laughs> until I see somebody who looks like they like it, I'm not going to start. <laughs> well, yeah, the problem with that is, yes, of course, they look miserable by the running and it's not any fun. And but after you get done running, you feel like you did something that you should have done and it's better for you. Yeah. And so what I would early on there, I guess, I don't know, I might've been 17, 18. I realized that I was spending more time doing stuff that was secular academically than I was spiritually. And so I, remember, I realized I was reading history books for 30, 40 minutes, and then I'd go to math, and then I'd go to whatever, but I, I wouldn't be reading my Bible. And so I kind of determined I'm going to read my Bible before I do any of my other school work for the time that I would do my longest school work study. So if I was going to read history for 40 minutes, then I'd read my Bible 40 minutes and then do the history and the math, etc. Well, I didn't like it it felt constrained and it felt like exercise and it felt like uh, it didn't give me a warm, fuzzy feeling. And I rolled through the genealogies and Leviticus and all that stuff and just thought, why is this in here? What am I doing here? But I just made myself do it. It was just something I said, I'm doing. And now it's something that I thoroughly enjoy and love. And lots of times if I have a choice between the Bible or some other exciting adventure book. I'm going for the Bible. But at first it was just something I just didn't like. And that's just a fact. I don't think you can get around that. And so if I were to tell Christians, hey, how can you really get through this stuff? I would say, forget how you feel about praying, reading the Bible, doing stuff for your family, doing stuff for others that you just don't feel the feeling there of whatever, who cares about the feeling, do it because it's your job. And later, I think you'll really be glad you did it. And it will open up insight for you just because you made yourself do it. And so, you know, the old Nike, just do it, just, just get them to do it. And eventually you'll feel what will follow from that. But if you wait for that feeling, it's not going to happen. That's right. That's right. And so many times when we just, you know, like we can, I think we understand in the secular realm, like you're talking about with exercise and with these sort of things, we understand the benefits of these things and, and that we have to do them, whether we feel like it or not. But sometimes we, we miss it in the spiritual because it's harder to wrap our minds around, but it's the same. Like we're going to, you know, we're going to eat every single day. We're going to eat multiple times a day. But are we feeding ourselves spiritually? If not, we're going to be malnourished. We're going to be starving to death. Right. And, you know, I really do think that our society has done an injustice to the term spiritual. And yeah. I think what we've considered to be spiritual is something where we feel an emotional twang that we feel like somehow we're closer to the universe or have connected with something on a non-material realm. But what I think is so interesting about how the Bible describes spiritual decisions, spiritual activities, spiritual experiences is it's not an emotional feeling. Something that spiritual is you read the Bible and it tells you to do something and you do it and you have just been involved in an amazing spiritual experience regardless of how you feel. And it's like when Paul said, if I preach the gospel out of necessity, a stewardship has been laid upon me. Basically, if I do it because it's my job, well, it's my job. And so, you know, a, a spiritual experience, telling somebody about the gospel when you don't feel like doing it is an extremely spiritual decision. 
reading your Bible when you don't feel like it and you feel nothing emotionally is a very spiritual decision. Spirituality right. means aligning your behavior with God's instructions. And that's what real spirituality is. And it's not, oh, hey, you know, I walked into a room full of incense and I felt like I was more connected to the universe. You know, doing things that don't feel fun are very, very spiritual lots of times. Certainly just reminds me of James 3 when he's talking about uh, earthly wisdom and how it's uh, sensual, that that's, you know, it's, it's affecting our senses. Right. And, and it's the opposite with, you know, he, that's what he says about earthly wisdom. The heavenly wisdom from above is, is uh, these other things. And so uh, very well put. I think that's a good reminder for all of us, if we're struggling or not, that we need to make sure that we're putting in that time, making these, these godly, these spiritual habits uh, part of our lives. Mm-hmm. Me too. So, so I, I, we were talking earlier about how many times you speak in a normal year. And I was kind of uh, blown away by you saying, you know, around 60 or, or plus times uh, sometimes as you travel and you're speaking on all these, these different events. And uh, you have that, you have uh, the Apologetics Press, um, uh, other things that you write for, recording, recording videos, and you have your, your family life and all of these things. I'm, I'm sure there's times when, when you feel overwhelmed, that you have so much on your plate, you may get unfocused, uh, you lost your focus temporarily. What are some things that you do to kind of get you back on track? You were right, it's busy. And <laughs> At the end of the day, sometimes I'll wonder, did that day have really, did it really have 24 hours in it? Because it sure didn't seem like it did, but I'm sure the sun rotated, the earth rotated around the sun, same amount, whatever. But I, I guess it just depends on who you are and what you are. You're talking to me personally. Mm-hmm. Like last night, I got to go on a date with my wife to this little hole in the wall place in Spring Hill, Tennessee called Delta Bound. It's got amazing food. And we came back and watched uh, basically a kind of like an Emily Bronte type romance movie that was fun to watch, just, you know, good and wholesome thoughts and stuff. And so going on a date with my wife, with my kids were kind of everywhere else. And it was just me and my wife. And so going on a date with my wife, getting to eat good food and getting to be with the person that I love on this planet the most is probably how I refocus and I think, okay, yes, this is, I'm, I'm involved in being a husband, a father, a worker at a politics press, et cetera. And then, you know, the other idea is I love what I do in the sense that yeah, I get to go pick up 350 study Bibles and drop them off to people that are about to pass them out. And I get to write articles that, I've gotten the question for, never really thought about an answer. I do the research, find the answer, write the article, and then post it out there and know that somebody's using it. Yeah. And the stat that bothers me so much is that 80% of people in the United States of America go to jobs that they hate, and they just do it for the money. And I am convinced, and I, I tell people this and my kids on a regular basis, that if you will find something productive to do in the Lord's kingdom, he'll pay you to do it or see that you have a job or situation where you can get it done. And, you know, I've had several other opportunities to do various different things that would have been maybe more lucrative or things of that nature, but have never even really thought about doing them because I feel like this is what I'm here on this planet to do. Really. And so I, I think something that really, that really helps as a motivator and keeps you going. And, you know, like sometimes at the end of the day, I'll have, oh, yesterday I proofread the second edition of our book on inspiration and then started reading for another proofing project, this little kid's book called Illuminators and got to do all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, that it's been a lot of work and I've been here and there doing all kinds of stuff, but it's energizing work to me because I feel mm-hmm. like okay, we just sent out a study Bible and this person's going to have a study Bible with their name stamped on it. And they might keep that for the next 25 years. And this little kid's book that I'm proofing, I'm going to have little kids come up to me and say, Hey, I read that. It was so fun. And I got a lot out of it. So, you know, I, I think one of the big things is 
that you're involved in things that you think are eternally important. And that keeps it from feeling like work. You know, I know a lot of people who go garden for a hobby. Well, you know, gardens work to a lot of people, but to some people, that's how they relax. Yeah. I mean, if you were to ask me, hey, how'd you feel about the five hours you spent proofreading today? Some people would hate proofreading stuff. But I think this is going to be used by kids for the next 10, 15 years. And I can't wait to get this out and for those kids to have it. And so it's energizing to me. So I guess I would say, you know, take your wife out on a date is always uh, helps me get refocused and be doing stuff that you feel like has eternal value. And if that means you're going to live in a smaller house and you're going to have to jump your car off on a regular basis, well, jump it off and live in the smaller house, but you'll feel better about how you're living ultimately and what your reward will be in eternity. Heavenly investments. That's right. Yes. I love that perspective. You know, I think a lot of our life, um, we get overwhelmed and focused. We get, we struggle with things because of our perspective, because of our expectations and these sort of things. And, and that's just a wonderful perspective to have. I, I love the decision that, you know, no matter what you're going to do, you're going to be storing up heavenly treasure. And so all of that work, it, you know, it may be hard, it may be busy, but you know that it has eternal consequences. Yeah. And, you know, as you say that, that's so, that, that's exactly how I think, because you go to Revelation and it says the books were open, another book was open, and everyone was judged by what they did in their body. Yeah. And so you've got, you know, lots of times I think, okay, I've got maybe, and, you know, keeping James in mind, maybe I don't, but I've got, 70 years, 75 years at the, at the most, maybe 80, whatever, but that's going to fly. And so what is it that I can be doing today that if I died right now would be storing up for myself treasures in heaven and would have an eternal impact on this planet while I'm here? And, you know, I think if, if people got up in the morning and say, said, okay, today, yeah, and sometimes you could have more of an eternal impact by passing out one little card like World Video Bible School has got these cards called the, the a Christian gift card that basically just takes you to World Video Bible School videos. And if you passed out one of those, just one, you might have done more spiritually and for an eternal betterment than you did all last week. Yeah. So if you just thought, okay, today I'm, gonna, I'm going to think of how I can do one thing today. Well, and then the next, what will happen is you get kind of addicted to it. And you think, well, how, many, how can I do two? Oh, well, if I did that, I could do three or four. And so you just kind of get rolling and thinking, I can, I can study with these three people on World English Institute, and I can send out these World Bible School lessons. And this is, this is fun. It's kind of like saving money, except on a, on a much more spiritual. I'm not great at saving money. I, I do a little bit better on the, <laughs> the spiritual <laughs> side of it. But it gets kind of where you start thinking, all right. You know, this is, this is really doing something. Mm -hmm. Excellent. But, and, and of course, I would caution always to say that, you know, I planted a pause water, but the Lord gave the increase. That's We're right. going to do any of this by the Lord's grace and his mercy. And it's not as if we're wanting any credit. Ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, we would respond to God. We're unprofitable servants. We're just doing what it is our duty to do. But I do think God designed us to be part of the, spiritual enrichment of our planet. And I think if we're not involved in that, then our motivation suffers. Certainly. I'm so glad you added that, that disclaimer there at the end, <laughs> all glory to God, you know, that, that this is one of the things that, you know, we're not doing this, you know, because I mean, of course it's benefiting us. Of course it's doing these things, but it's really because it's God's work and, and we are uh, servants of him and that, at this, we're not trying to take credit for it, you know, and, and that was the pitfall of, of so many, especially in the first century, that they were doing these things for the praise of men, and they had their reward. We're looking for, like you said, that eternal, that eternal prize, that those eternal investments. Right, and just to kind of tag on to that thought, you know, when Mordecai goes to Esther, and he says, you need to save our people, yeah. and if you don't go to the king now, God will find somebody else to do it. Somebody else will. And then you and your family will be destroyed. 
Yeah. You know, it's not as if, okay, God, just, he just couldn't do this without me. I mean, it's lucky he's got me because if it wasn't for me, well, God, God's going to get his work done. Yep. He just wants to know if you want to be a part of it. And so he graciously lets you be a part of it if you will and will decide to. But it's not as if he needs you for anything. Yeah. I, you know, look at Psalm 50 where he says, if I was hungry, I wouldn't ask you because the world is mine. I don't count on a thousand hills. I don't need anything from you. I'm going to let you be a part of my work for your benefit, but it's not for mine. Yeah. And just as John says to the Pharisees, you know, don't, don't think that you can say Abraham is my father. You can raise up children from these stones. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. This, that, that um, quote from Esther is one of my all time favorites. That's one that I always think of that it's, you know, it's up to that we get to do these things. And if, if we don't do them, that, you know, who knows if we have been put in this earth for that very purpose. Right. And, and if we don't take advantage of it, God's going to bring someone else in that, that most certainly will, because his will will be done. That's right. Yep. Great perspective. And, and lastly, Kyle, uh, thinking of the church, all the things that we have going for the church, what is something, um, possibly the best thing that we have going for the church that we're not fully utilizing, that we're under underutilizing? You know, I was thinking maybe more from a practical standpoint on that. And there's two things that I would say in that regard. Uh, number one, I think we have discounted the ability of our younger Christians to be full-fledged workers in the kingdom. And a friend of mine, Tony Schott, and I wrote a book titled God's Power in Youth. And in that, we talk about how young people, 12, 13, 14, 15, who become Christians, they're not practicing to be better Christians and 18 players when they're 30 or 45. They are just as valuable, just as hard workers, and sometimes harder yeah. than other members of the Lord's church. And I'm not trying to compare that, but lots of times if you were to look at who is inviting people to the services in an evangelistic type way, or who is wanting to go on short-term mission trips and teach or be a part of some type of medical help in various different places. Lots of times it's the young people. And you'll hear prayers where people will say, Lord, please bless our young people for they're the future of the church. But when you look at Timothy and Mary, who was probably 15 or 16, if we understand it, and Titus, who was probably a young preacher, when Paul says, don't let anybody despise your youth, yeah. he's saying you are full-fledged members of the Lord's church and you can do the work of an evangelist as a young person. Yeah. And lots of times, if, if a person doesn't become a Christian before they're 15 years old, then the percentage of them becoming a Christian chance drops tremendously. And the people who can reach those people are their peer group, their younger teenage Christians. And so I would say that I feel like we've kind of gotten into a rut of entertaining our young people and hoping that they'll hold on to their faith through a secular education in college, et cetera. And maybe they'll come out and start being productive members of the Lord's church afterward when they marry somebody who will help them be a Christian, whatever. But I really think we need to adjust that approach some to say, you are a powerful member of the Lord's church at the present at 15 years old, you're not going to go into your school system and just try to hang on to your faith. You're going to try to spread it. Yeah. And when you get to college, it's not going to be, oh, we hope the secular education doesn't ruin your faith. It's going to be, you're going to be fighting a spiritual battle there and you can win it and you can bring others to your side because there are young people there who wish they could know somebody who had the courage to stand up and say, God created everything and I'm on God's side and you need to be too. And so I, I really think that we're underutilizing the youth of the church, and we need to address them in a way that helps them see their usefulness and their spiritual power and their responsibility to be involved in the Lord's work at, right when they become Christians. Now, I understand there's a growth process and you know, you read about how when a person becomes Christian, they need to desire the sincere milk of the word as newborn babes, et cetera. But I also understand that 
our young people can really be changing other people's lives. And I've seen it. And, you know, in our book, we just detail how many young people are, are doing things like like you're doing. I, mean, I was talking to a 12 year old not long ago who just started the podcast and had several listeners. And I was talking to another young lady who was doing amazing things where she was. And so that and I really think that, uh, you know, just practically speaking, I think World Video Bible School is kind of underutilized. They've got answers to about every question out there. They've got cutting edge type videos and things. And I think they're just not a lot of people that, well, I think there are a lot of people that know about them, but maybe not as many. Mm -hmm. And so the more we could get this information out and say, hey, there's videos on every subject you've got yeah. or need. Here's something that you could use. Well, I think that would be tremendous. And, you know, I hate, I'm, I hate to throw this in as a little commercial, but I will. Our AP study Bible, the other day I went to a congregation, they're supporters of ours. The study Bible has been out for two years, but they didn't know about it. And so when they saw it, they said, oh, wow, I need to get this for my son. And this needs to go. To, and people are getting it for their graduating seniors. And it's something that, OK, you could I mean, if, if you decided to, like Jenny Hanson did, raise the money and give one of these to every senior in a public high school. Mm -hmm. you could. And I think there would be a tremendous spiritual impact of that. Or if you just decided, OK, I'm a grandmother, I'm going to make sure my grandson who is not really spiritually focused right now has one etc so i would say maybe some of those resources like world video bible school and apologetics press and christian courier and gospel broadcasting and some of those guys that are real effective at presenting the gospel i think could be used more in a more evangelistic way sorry hitting people where they are when you give them a christian gift card i'll give you an example um Rudy came, I was down there doing some videoing and he was talking to me about that little Christian gift card. And so I got several of them. And he said, let me tell you what happened to one of mine. I leave them everywhere. He said, I leave them on tables. He said, he'll go into Walmart and the Bibles, he'll open the Bible and put one in it and, you know, put, put the little card and all the Bibles that they're selling there at Walmart or whatever. <laughs> and he said, we were at a restaurant the other day and I had put one on the table and we were sitting a couple tables over and a couple sat down at that table and saw the Christian gift card. It's got a little QR code on the back and they scanned it and started watching the video right there at their table. at <laughs> wow. a restaurant. Wow. And he said, of course, you know, you don't know who does this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might pass out 500 of them and, and two people do that or maybe none. But he said, I sat and watched these people hit the QR code and start a video before their meal. Right there. Wow. And right there. So you just never know what, the Lord is doing with your efforts to, to do things like that. And so stuff like World Video Bible School, Positive Express, give them a Bible, give them a two cent little card, direct them to a website, something that can really, really evangelistically impact them. Wonderful. I know you had uh, mentioned the, the study Bible. Where can, where can people, if they're interested in getting that, where can they get it at? Well, so like uh, I think Dehoff Bookstore has it and several bookstores in the Brotherhood have it, but you can get it directly from apologeticspress.org. That's how most people access it. And so you just go on there and type in defending the state faith study Bible in the search engine, or there's a little place on the left side of our website that says store, and that'll mm -hmm. take you right to it. And so apologeticspress.org is probably your very best place to get that. Okay. Kyle, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking with me. This has been so uplifting for me. And Lord willing, it will be encouraging, inspiring for others who will listen to it in the future. Well, Adam, I appreciate what you're doing. And thank you for letting me be a part of it. It's thrilling to see the positive perspective that you've got on things. And I really do think that the Lord's Church is amazing and that the Lord has blessed us with so many opportunities. And if we could just open our eyes and be involved in more of those, it would just show us how much the Lord's still working in this world and remind us that he's in control and that we're his church and he loves us and delights in us. And it's neat to have that neat as understatement of the universe, <laughs> but 
have that relationship with a God who created everything, who knows every atom, every subatomic particle, and who knows us personally and still loves us. Amen. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thanks, Adam. Be an encourager, lift each other up. There can never be enough of the building of his kingdom.